We've just started a series of messages on who we are in Christ, looking at the in Christ passages, many of them in the New Testament. Today we're looking at no condemnation, which comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Who we are in Christ. Why a series on that? Well, because we finding our identity in Jesus Christ is probably one of the most important steps in Christian discipleship. If we don't know who we are, we won't act in character. If we try to define ourselves based on other criterion, then we won't know who we truly are because our true identity can only be known in Christ Jesus. Last week we found that if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation, that the word if indicates that there is another option, and that is to be not in Christ. For our purposes in this series of messages, in Christ means one who is a believer in and a follower of Jesus Christ. In other words, someone who is a part of the church, capital C, Church Universal. That there is a distinct dichotomy between the old self and the new self, a dividing line when one personally accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That there will be change in a person, and that it starts with a decision. And I gave an opportunity for that decision if it had not been made before. So continuing today, let's look again at Romans chapter 8, just the first two verses. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. The doctrine of original sin is one that is critical to understanding Christian theology and Jewish theology for that matter. Because in that doctrine, we learn that all humans are infected with the sin of Adam. As I said, it's called the doctrine of original sin. It's not so named in the Bible, but it is certainly framed in the Bible. And the church has coined the term original sin, much like the word term uh, trinity, to help explain a truth. That every human being born on earth is prone to sin. Even before one is old enough to differentiate between right and wrong, sin has crept into one's life. Watch two babies in a playpen and see. Before too long, one baby will take what the other baby is playing with, causing the other baby to cry and strike back. Watch two young children playing. One will pick up a toy to play with it, and the other will immediately want that toy. Original sin is a way to describe that self-centeredness of all people from the earliest age, and self-centeredness is the root of all sin. In other words, placing the self before God. And no one is exempt. All are caught in the net of original sin. It is said that we inherit it from Adam, and some have devised interesting theories to explain when and how that taint of sin enters our lives, the Roman Catholic Church has said that it occurs at conception, which has led many to believe over the years that the sex act itself is sinful, since that is when original sin is passed on. I don't know when it occurs. I just know that we all have it, every single one of us. There is nothing we can do to free ourselves from this curse. We can't be good enough to overcome our sinful nature. Sin is just so deeply ingrained in us that we cannot separate ourselves from it. We need a savior. This is a good place to say amen. Yeah. <laughs> especially you, pastor. No, don't say that. <laughs> but yes, especially me. And God, thanks be unto him, has provided the way for all humans to be free from this curse. God provided a savior. In fact, God became our savior. Pastor John McFarland shared this illustration with me many, many years ago. You've probably heard it, but uh, it's, it's good to repeat now. Imagine a map of the border between the United States and Mexico. 
Now imagine that it is a totally open border. It doesn't take a lot of imagination, but that anyone can cross at any time, at any point, with no problems at all. Now, if you owned a spot on that border and invited people to cross at your spot, you probably wouldn't get very many takers since anyone can cross at any point, right? Well, now imagine a totally closed border where no one can cross at any place at any time except for your spot. At that one spot, anyone can cross the border for free with no problems, but the rest of the border is totally closed. Don't you think that the word would get around about that spot? And don't you think that the news of that spot, that one spot, would be considered good news? The popular opinion today is to believe that all religions lead to the same God, that all ways are equally valid and equally good. And even some Christians believe that other religions offer equally valid ways of reaching heaven. The problem with this idea is that the Bible does not agree with that notion. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is the only way across the border, dividing life and eternal life. Jesus is God's only provision for salvation, but it is his provision. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. The Bible is clear on this point. The Old Testament is full of commandments and prohibitions from God for the people of God to stay away from all other religions. And the New Testament teaches that only in Christ is their salvation. I really don't see how any other position can be justified in Scripture. And that's the key. Folks who don't uh, believe this tend not to have a high opinion of Scripture. They say that other religions are equally valid. And to say this is to say that Jesus didn't have to die, that it was not necessary, that he died in vain, because we could all be saved by other means if Jesus' death was not necessary. But the truth is, the truth is that Jesus' death was necessary, and by his death and resurrection, all people are offered salvation. The only way to avoid the condemnation of Adam is to be in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 says, For all, as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. When it says all die in Adam, that's a reference to original sin, since we are all spiritual descendants of Adam. Paul fleshes this concept out a bit more in Romans chapter 5. In verse 12 it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. Jumping down to verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if the man died through, for if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And then jump down to verse 17. If because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. In other words, the only way to avoid the condemnation of Adam's sin is to trust in Christ. So we live under, or at least we have lived under condemnation. What does it look like to live under condemnation? Well, it looks like constantly trying to prove oneself worthy. The heavy feeling that you are just not good enough and you have to be better to be acceptable. The sentence to live with repetitive sinful behavior and addictions with no way out. Being doomed to failure in every attempt to please God and living for self alone, using and abusing others 
for one's own gain. And those of us who are in Christ are still affected by the curse of condemnation because others live under that curse. That is why there is so much crime and injustice. These things are a direct result of the curse of condemnation, and it affects us even though we be in Christ. So what does it mean to live out from under condemnation? It means being in Christ frees us from the curse. We are set free in Christ. John 8, verse 36 says, So if the Son makes you free, you will, you will be free indeed. And Romans 8, 2, again, says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. What does it look like to not live under condemnation? Well, one is no longer bent toward sinning. Knowing who you are in Christ means you are no longer burdened with low self-esteem because you have Christ-esteem. And the power of the Holy Spirit can heal and set us free from all kinds of addictions and repetitive sinful behavior. And perhaps the best thing about living out from under condemnation is that we have hope. We have hope. The good news is that everyone can be free of the curse. It's not limited to a certain group. All can be in Christ, every land, every nation, every tribe. The curse is lifted in Christ Jesus, and that is news good enough to share. Like the only hole in the fence, Jesus Christ is good news for a lost world, and we owe it to our neighbors to our friends and to our family members, to let them know that they don't have to live under the curse anymore. They too can be set free to live under no condemnation. At the end of the service today, after the benediction, if you'd like to come up and, and receive prayer, if you have a family member or a neighbor or a friend that you would like to pray for, you are welcome to come up and, uh, and receive prayer ministry. Next week will be Mother's Day. Well, somebody's happy. <laughs> and I will be gone. Oh, I figured we'd get a big cheer at that one. Here comes the cheer. In my place will be Pastor Anthony Boger. Thank you, honey. <laughs> Love you too, baby. <laughs> I'll be in Indianapolis attending the WCA Global Gathering, uh, so, and uh, uh, I'm sure uh, Anthony will give a great sermon. Two weeks from today, we'll continue this series of who we are in Christ with the subtitle, One Body. I want you to read Romans 12, verse 5, and Galatians 3, verse 28 in preparation. Romans 12, 5, and Galatians 3, 28. Right now, let's spend a few moments in prayerful reflection as we consider what God is saying to our hearts today.